Okay, Adjutorium Nostrum in Omni Domini. Thank you. Thank you, Chilam All right, so Father Bishop Four, Father Four, was consecrated a bishop on um, this Thursday by Bishop Williamson. It was uh, quite an incredible, incredible event. Um, <clears throat> so here it's pretty cold out, and you're getting some sunshine in Toronto. But down there, there's lizards and tropical plants, and the uh, I don't even know the name of the red fruit that, that just grows uh, down near the monastery grounds. The, all the tropical flowers and palm trees and ferns. So it's in that setting that this, the monastery is in. And the monastery is very Spartan. Their oven is a, actually a wood burnt stove made out of brick with the, uh, you know, simple three or four sinks and very simple, very simple, the place. And it's there that uh, the consecrations took place. And Bishop Four, he took for his <coughs> motto, Ipsa Conteret. Anybody know what that means? Ipsa Conteret. Anybody have a guess? She will crush? She yes. Crush. She shall crush. Those are the words from, Saint, from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God prophesizes the role of the Virgin Mary, that she shall crush the head of the serpent. So, um, Bishop Four took, took that as his, as his great motto, and it's very fitting, because we're really... We're really down to the wire, uh, meaning the Catholic faith, at least those publicly professing and defending it, uh, you know, God bless Bishop Burke for opposing abortion and sodomites, but he's, if he accepts Vatican II and the new mass, he's accepting going along with abortion and sodomites. They don't see that, these modernist bishops, because the principles of Vatican II lead logically to abortion and sodomites. That's ex ex exactly what it leads to. So really, when you get down to it right now, there's only two bishops in the world who are publicly professing the faith. Two and a half, because Bishop, Bishop Tissier, he did come out uh, responding to the consecrations, and his response was one of gratitude. And he'll probably get hanged for that. He didn't condemn it. So I'm sure he's going to be put on the oven by, by Bishop Follet for that one. So it's ipsa contra. It's very, it plays into our times because the worse things get, and they are getting worse, that means the Virgin Mary's role is getting closer, where she's going to have a victory, something far greater than Our Lady Guadalupe, where she will crush the head of the devil and have another great victory, and it will be clear that it's her victory and no one else's. So it's really a great Bishop Ford took this um, motto. Secondly, Bishop Ford, it's, it's very important you realize this, that he's in the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. Archbishop Lefebvre chose, firstly, four bishops, in 1988. The first choice was Bishop Williamson. Second choice, Father Four. Father Four was his second choice. And uh, Bishop Four, he declined out of humility and suggested Father Galaretta. So Bishop Lefebvre chose Bishop Galaretta. And Bishop Tissier de Mallory, of course, was chosen also because he's a he, he, he's great on theology and combating the modernism, at least in writing and preaching. Uh, and then uh, um, the three of them were chosen first. Bishop Four backed out out of humility. And the Swiss people came. It was first going to be three bishops. And the Swiss people came and said, you know, we've, we've done so much for your seminary. You're here in Switzerland. Why don't you choose a bishop from Switzerland? And that's where, in the last few moments, Bishop Fillet was chosen, the youngest. Bishop Fillet has always been the bursar. And open brackets, who among the apostles was also the bursar? 
Cheers. Yeah. All right, I'm not drawing any conclusions. I'm just asking the question. But uh, pray for Bishop Fillet. It's, it's, uh, it's very dangerous what he's doing. So those four bishops were consecrated, but it's very important to see that Father Four was chosen by Archbishop Lefebvre. And here we are now, uh, how many years later, 2015, and Bishop Williamson in a state that he never dreamt he'd be in, alone, standing alone to defend Catholic tradition, while the others want to go with a false agreement with modernists, and having compromised on doctrine, on the new mass, on Vatican II, on the new code, and so forth. So, Father Four was chosen by the Archbishop. It's very important for us to realize that that continuity. It's a great blessing. So, uh, so at the consecration, um, you'll see the, be able to see the mass in full force. It'll be out one of these days soon on the internet. The whole ceremony. There was a full professional camera filming everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bishop for um, being anointed, being uh, crowned with the head, and receiving the mitre. And the mitre symbolizes the horns of light shining off of Moses' head, commanding and preaching with authority. And so uh, the excommunications from Rome, we, we say, well, big deal. What's an excommunication from a pope? who's praising communists, Freemasons, Sodomites, destroying the Catholic Church. What does that mean? He, he should be excommunicating all his rotten bishops and professors in the seminaries. But the ones who get excommunicated are those who hold on to the faith. So that's a good sign. That's a good sign. So let him excommunicate. Let him throw all the lightning bolts he wants. We stand on the shoulders of Christ the King and all the popes of tradition. And all the popes of tradition condemn Pope Francis, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, Pope John XXIII, Pope Paul VI, who are not blessed, they are not saints, and even John XXIII's body is not really incorrupt, unlike true saints. His body is, is there, rotting. It's so filled with formaldehyde, the mortician who took care of his body said, I put extra, extra, extra supercharged formaldehyde in his body. So some year that's going to fade off and they're going to really have to bury him fast because he's going to stink. <laughs> like Pope Paul VI, when he died, the body was so already rotting when it was laying in state and being visited by all the visitors, the Swiss guards were passing out. They had to cover his body with plexiglass. It stunk so bad. This is blessed Paul the Sixth. So these phony canonizations and beatifications, they speak for themselves. Plus, they broke all the rules doing canonizations and beatifications. Some of them, like Padre Pio and the martyrs of England, who were canonized by Pope Paul the Sixth. Some saints under Pope John Paul the Second, that he did, like Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Some of them are obvious saints and martyrs. You know. They're just obvious saints because their whole life was holy and they died martyrs. But anyway, so um, here we are. We're on a new, uh, a new phase of the war. And it's a great encouragement that uh, Bishop Four will eventually be traveling through. He is older. He doesn't have perfect health, so uh, he's going to have to take it a little slower. But pray for him. And uh, may I suggest that you, uh, you know, pray for Bishop Williamson, of course, and write him. Thank Bishop Williamson for this heroic act. And that's a great crown in Bishop Williamson's crown in heaven, you know, to uh, continue the Catholic doctrine and the fight for the faith, opposing modernism and, and the Vatican too. And uh, about Bishop Follet and all the priests going with him, it's, it's frightening that this could happen. But we're living through it. We're living through Vatican IIb. And this is good for you youngsters because 50 years ago, it's your parents and grandparents that had to fight for the faith. Now it's your turn. Welcome to the war. And this one is a little more camouflaged because it's, it's revolution with traditional vestments, traditional incense, and Latin. So it's a little more camouflaged, but it's still the same rottenness underneath. Vatican II, new mass and all those errors.
<clears throat> so anyway, uh, it was a great dinner afterwards. All the priests sat down and and they really they really uh, had a wonderful feast. The sisters were there. Many people from all over. Families drove in from Uruguay. The Uruguay couple they were begging for priests to come, and we were happy to tell them we do have priests coming. We have nine studying in Kentucky, one uh, one brother, and down the road hopefully priests to come. And this summer Bishop Williamson will ordain Dr. Sunil, who's a medical doctor from India, and a very good doctor. He has saved many lives and helped many people in India. He sacrificed all his education, all the money put into it to become a priest. He's practicing now the dry mass, that is a priest who goes, deacon who goes to the mass, all the movements to practice. And uh, he'll be ordained this summer, uh, most likely in India, but we're trying to get him ordained in the U.S. if possible, but we'll see. So uh, there is future, there is hope, and uh, that great motto, Ipsa Contaret, what a motto, and what timely motto for, for our time. Because she, you know, the devil, the Freemasons and the Jews and these uh, enemies of Christ, they're boasting. They've got their noses high, they're riding high, they think they have succeeded, they're boasting of their conquest over Christ and Christendom. They're, they're about ready to bury the crucifix now and, you know, done with Catholicism once and for all. They've got a pope who's promoting Freemasonic doctrine, these last four or five popes. What more could the enemies of Christ ask for? And yet, the devil knows he's working really hard because he knows the last few minutes are ticking away. And he knows that prophecy. So it's like Mike Tyson uh, stepping into a ring with little... Um, uh, Alexandria, is it? Annie, that's right, little Annie. Imagine Annie, little Annie standing up to Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali, and she just slaps him, turns him down, and crushes his head with her foot. That's the role of the Virgin Mary. This little tender, sweet girl, immaculate, virgin, no sin, never stained or under the claws of the devil. Her sweet, tender little feet are just going to crush the brains and blood out of the head of the serpent. That's her role, and it's a great role. So she's our mother, and we're waiting for that day because it's coming around the corner. The enemies think they've won, but they're in for a big surprise. So it's a great grace that you can persevere now and uh, be with the resistance, and uh, you know we have to be humble and pray because we have to all realize any of us could fall. And look at all the poor priests who are slipping away with this. So pray for them, good priests, who are just going along. And they shouldn't be. We should have learned our lesson not to go with the mainstream, and not to go with superiors under obedience when they disobey Catholic tradition and their own founder. Bishop Fillet is disobedient to all the popes and Bishop uh, Lefebvre, his founder. And they think they can do better. And they're saying Rome has changed. And Benedict XVI was great. And you know what has to be publicly condemned is Sumorum Pontificum. Let it be publicly known that that document is straight out of hell. Because it puts, they love that document because they say it frees the Latin Mass. It doesn't free the Latin Mass. You know what that document says? The priest who says any Latin Mass, extraordinary form, has to accept what? He has to accept the Nova Soto Mass. And he has to put the Catholic Mass, the true sacrifice, Christ, on an equal level with the new Mass. Christ with Barabbas. Sorry. That document, Sumorum Pontificum, psh, let it be condemned. And it will be someday by some Pope. It was another slippery tongue piece to deceive the Society of St. Pius X. And they fell for it. They fell for it. It's incredible. <clears throat> All right, I don't want to go too long. I know it's already late, but I want to congratulate you folks for persevering and and uh, write Bishop Williamson. Thank him. He did a real heroic act, and he might still do another consecration in France. I just want to see, wasn't he going to do another one? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. We'll see. 
But uh, as long as the enemies haven't shot them, uh, <laughs> not that I wish that, but that would be quite a crown to be a martyr on top of all this. But uh, Bishop Williamson, what a blessing. So congratulate him and thank him. We are, we've, we're left orphans, you know. We turn to our Pope, give us bread, and we get scorpions. <clears throat> give us doctrine, and we get, uh, we get rocks. Do we still continue to go to the society? The society and buys attend masses? Well, objectively, no. Why? Because they are, they are really compromised on doctrine now. They're really officially, even though most of the priests, many of them don't agree, they don't like it, they want to do something, but they're maybe too fearful or under pressure. But as a, as a system, as a, as a whole, the Society of Saint has compromised on doctrine. And the proof is six conditions, uh, the doctrinal declaration of April, 12, April 15th, 2012. Do you think the priests know about <coughs> the consecration? in the society because they oh, do they know? <laughs> <laughs> they all got this communique from oh, Menzing and okay. denouncing it on the very same day. Oh, really? Oh, they all got it. Oh. So pray for some of them. It might be an eye-opener to realize, hey, there really is a war here. There really are two religions at war in our society, St. Pius X. And we claim to continue this society, St. Pius X. We're not some new organization. We are the work of Archbishop Lefebvre continue. We stand on that. We don't want to change. The Archbishop set up a great structure. He set up a great organization. It's not the Catholic Church. It's not the Thy Kingdom Come, but it is an oasis of the faith. And it's proved that it worked up until 2012. And now that they've cited a slide on doctrine and compromise, the vocations are diminishing. The parishes and missions are going down, and they're not coming to the resistance. They're going to the Ecclesia Dei Masses. They're going to Motu Proprio Novus Ordo Masses. And two priests of the society, do you know this? Two priests, one in India, a French priest, and one in France, packed up, left the priories in shorts and a t-shirt, saying, hey, if we're going to Rome, what are we waiting for? They were priors, and they left to the Novus Ordo. And many people are doing the same. Well, the Bishop Filet wants to go with Rome. What are we waiting for? It's easier to go to a cathedral mass with the priest saying the Latin mass with a beautiful paid choir. Half of them are Protestants. And uh, sandwiched between two Novus Ordo masses. It's easy. And they lose their faith. Because they don't hear any more condemnations of Vatican II and condemnations of the new mass, condemnations of the scandals of this pope and the modernist bishops. And if you're not warned about the wolves, you become food for the wolves. If you don't fight the wolves, you're food for it. So, uh, uh, just, when was it? Just, I, I just flew in from Brazil. Today, had mass in Toronto, came down here. It was a 10-hour flight. But yesterday, I, uh, we went on a hike with a number of the boys there. And this little boy, uh, Mateus, he lives at this monastery in uh, Santa Cruz. And he's like 12, but he's a, he's a feisty little guy. And uh, he, he was watching. They were wondering why so many chickens and eggs were missing. And so this boy went out and he found the fox. And he set a trap, but the fox outsmarted him and went in another way. So he and another friend went out with their gun, and they killed the fox. And he brought it back to all the monks, showing the fox his trophy. And uh, the fox that was eating the, the chickens and the eggs. Uh, so the little Mateus uh, you know, protected the, the chickens. And that's kind of where we're at now. The chickens are the traditional Catholics that are left. The foxes are the modernist Rome. And uh, Bishop, Fuller, Bishop Williamson pulled a fast one. He consecrated uh, Bishop Four and maybe another one to come. And uh, it, it just, it, it's, it's going to make the enemies of Christ pretty upset. But that's what we're here for. So to, to hold high the Christ the King. Yes. Did they say that they hold another ceremony in France or something? Yes, Bishop Four and Father P. 
Piver. Father Piver was at the consecrations also in Brazil. And one of the priests, Father Per Emmanuel, right? That I don't know. Per Emmanuel. Uh, yeah, Father Emmanuel from one of the priests in Avrier, the Dominican monks. They were there. So, yes, they're possibly going to start a seminary where the seminarians will have classes in Avrier with the monks, but live apart. So they're not fully in the monastic setting, they're not disturbing the monastic setting, but they live apart. Kind of like what was early days in, in Freiburg. Archbishop Lefebvre had them in the seminary life, but they do their classes at the university. So instead of the... But those universities in Freiburg were going modernist already. So that's why Bishop Lefebvre was forced to have the seminary but in, your, in the United States, you know, it's, it's a 10-year formation in Avrier for their monks. But we're in an emergency situation. 10 years is too long. We've got souls begging for the Mass, dying, crying out for, give us water to drink. <clears throat> so the seminary is very important. So there will be one in France. The U.S. has already kicked off. And Father uh, Chazal has one seminary in the Philippines, and he's building a bamboo seminary. <laughs> so, guaranteed to withstand any uh, monsoons. <laughs> any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I found a video online of Bishop Williamson. I think it was a sermon, and uh, I think it was in Spanish or something. Yes, it was so in Spanish. Is there going to be a translation? Oh, English? no doubt. Okay. Oh, no doubt, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Bishop Williamson, you know, when he came to St. Catherine's at that time? Yes. And then since then, everybody was wondering, you know, what his mindset was, because you couldn't quite understand why he was so <laughs> one way. Right. And now I was wondering, you know, because he's now consecrated, did he tell any of you, you know, I've always had this leaning, or did this just come to me like a bolt of lightning all of a sudden? Or, you know, how did he... Decide how long has he decided he was going to do this? Nobody knows. I don't know. I can't <laughs> answer that. But I'm just grateful he did it. <laughs> yeah. I can say this though, Bishop Four. The Americans don't know him because he's always been in South America. But he comes from a family that, as I told you before, they were persecuted by the communists in Algeria. They had to flee for their life. They were being they were going to be massacred with cold machetes and cold blood. So uh, his family ended up in South America. And he's been working there all these years, over 30 years with the society down there. Everything is due to him and his work. He's, he's, he's just, well, you'll meet him, I hope. He's just, he reminds me very much of the spirit of the Archbishop. Strong as an ox, tough as nails, but gentle with people, very joyful, very peaceful. You can see it in the pictures. You know, he's, he's a real, he's the stuff of a bishop. He was made for this. He was made for this. You just know it. And, you know, he came out after the consecration ceremony, he came out in his purple as a bishop. And uh, everyone flocked to receive his blessing and kiss his ring. And it's just, you can just, you could just, almost visibly see the downpouring of grace on the ceremony on that whole day at the monastery. And all these good people who came, uh, many sacrifices to be there, it was just something to see. So I know you all, you know, I wish you could have all been there, but you're in the trenches and you're in the fight, so hopefully he'll be through, you know. And Bishop Williamson, he's not retiring either, you know, he's, <laughs> this one I think will strengthen him. Bishop Williamson, you know, put yourself in his shoes, you know, it gets lonely up on top and the wind gets heavy and he's got the devils attacking him, he's got Rome crushing him, he's got the Julio Masons, he's got the, everybody against him. So when he said maybe some blunders here or there, or say some inaccuracies here or there, who of us could do better, you know, I, seriously. So I just thank God he did it. I, I, for him, it's going to be no doubt a channel of much grace. And the old roaring Beckett from England might, <laughs> might still be heard again. He preached for the monks on the feast of March 21st. Whose feast day is that? March 21st. A big first class feast at a Benedictine monastery. 
Say Benedict. So that was, of course, a big day. And uh, Bishop Williamson did the Mass, preached. And then they had a big uh, meal with all the priests and brothers and monks. It was big fish served with the head, eyeballs, even teeth on these fish from Brazil <laughs> with tails and fins and sliced up. That, that was the meal. <laughs> with fruits right out of their backyards. Yes. Um, you see the Bishop Tizzy I'm sorry? Did you say Bishop Tizzy Damani put out a statement? He didn't put out a statement. Uh, I just know it was a response that he made okay. to Don Thomas Aquinas, who told us that Bishop Tizzy responded, but it wasn't negative at all. It was actually expressing gratitude. So was that a personal correspondence? Yeah. It was. was. Not, no. no, that wasn't public. Okay. We're kind of spilling the beans here, but... Uh, <laughs> But that's okay, because Bishop Tissier, he's got to see now there's a line drawn. Right. And it'll be a miracle if he can just step forward to defend the society that he loves so much. He really loves the SSPX, that's why he... But we love the SSPX too, but we love the truth more. And if the leader is crashing it, we got to stand with the truth. Is so. there a chance he'll come over? Bishop Tissier? Yeah. Keep praying. Keep praying. I'm sure he's not far. You know? It's one thing to say, it's another to do. And it's a special grace. You can help him with your prayers and letters too. Write them. Write them and say, look, you weren't consecrated a bishop to be, you know, compromising the faith with Bishop Philip. They won't intercept their letters? Uh, good question. I know one priest told his sister, don't write me, don't email me, don't call me, because everything's monitored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So when it comes to things being monitored, no doubt the SSPX is watching these videos and keeping a check on Oh, they do better than we. <laughs> <laughs> In my letter, my second letter or third, which they messed it up, so I don't know which one. In one of my letters of monition, they had, you said this, that sermon on this date in this place. And they had about 15 places and 15 different sermons. I can't even remember all that. <laughs> and they had it pegged. And Father Pfeiffer, too, they had the same thing, a whole list. So they're watching. They're watching. But there are brothers, and I just hope they'll stand strong. You know. Does so, Bishop speak, I mean, does Bishop Forrest speak English? He does well. Yes, he does. He thinks it's terrible, but we spoke with him about two hours, Father Pfeiffer and I, in a conversation in the green grass under this paradise weather in Brazil, and uh, with monkeys and trees and tropical birds and pine cones like this, <coughs> lizards running around. And uh, just and flowers, tropical flowers everywhere, and just magnificent, beautiful place. You know, South America, uh, it, the open brackets, if it wasn't Catholic and it was all Protestant, it would be the world power of the world. The crops, the weather, the, the, the industry, everything is there to be a world power. But the Judeo Masons didn't want South America world power. Why? It's so Catholic. They had to destroy the faith first. But the place is just a paradise. <clears throat> but anyway, Bishop Four speaks good English, and uh, he'll get better. You know, and he knows, like we discussed, and I told him, you know, your life from now on is a living crucifixion. There's no doubt. It's for the love of Christ and the church. You know? So and you little guys, you're in the war. You are in the war, you uh, young ones. And what an honor, you know. You carry on the faith. And you, ones, you little ones, or younger ones, might be the ones to see the Antichrist. And maybe we, uh, we will too, because time is going shorter. Things are getting shorter. Time is shortened. Uh, the days are shortened, uh, as our Lord said. 
And uh, the Antichrist is going to invent new and old tortures. So pray to have a strong faith. <laughs> you know? So, yes. Father, do you have any comments on the um, on the life and prophecies of uh, Marie Julie Jaheni? Uh, yes, you can find a lot of it on Trad Cat Knight. He puts out a lot in her pictures. All I can say is her prophecies seem very true, you know. Also, Mother Mary Aiello. She's very good. She, she describes the red flag going over the dome of St. Peter's. You know? It's already the Masonic flag. That's maybe what she meant, because it's there now in ideas. And the, in the 180 years ago, the Freemason says, our dream is not to have a Masonic Pope, necessarily but a Pope who will promote Masonic ideas so that we will win, the re our revolution will march under the banner of the Petrine Keys and the, uh, the, the Tiara and Cope. So they've got their dream. Pope Francis, I mean, they're just partying. They're, they're toasting and they think they've won. They've got the Pope they wanted. And this Pope is just... You just have no words. Everyone just shakes their heads. <laughs> just put the adjective, put the dictionary of adjectives aside. Just, so just pray for the poor soul. Anyway, so these are exciting days, and I really, I really think we're on. You know, we're going to get punished. We're going to get scourged by God's chastisement. We are, but on the other side, Our Lady's victory is on the way. And uh, I think Bishop Four, with him, is going to be like a, another part two of Archbishop Lefebvre. Mm -hmm. Because he's a builder. His history proves it. He's a builder for seminaries, priories, missions, and he loves the sheep. He loves souls. He has a shepherd's heart. He really does. And, uh, and what's great is that he's been through the blisters and, you know, He's been through the war. And he's so. willing to do it again. Right. So he understands Father Father Pfeiffer very well. He was Father Pfeiffer, you know, he's a builder, he's a mover, and he's a shaker. <laughs> he, he's called the burly priest. <laughs> but he Father Pfeiffer with you know, we all have our faults and mine are endless as well. And but Father Pfeiffer, you know, working with him, he is very generous. He will give his life for any lamb. He, he really loves souls. If there's a soul crying for, he can't get a priest, and they're dying, he'll go. He'll walk if he has to. And uh, he has the vision of Archbishop Lefebvre. Plus, he was raised by two old priests when he was growing up. At your age, uh, Sean and Chris, they were around two old warriors, Father Hannafin and Father Urban Snyder. And uh, he remembers the day Father Timmy came, little Timmy came running in and said, uh, Father, Father Hannafin, who was a feisty Irishman, he said, Father, ha Father Hannafin was talking with a whole bunch, you know, a handful of novice Ordo priests, telling them, you got to get back to tradition, say the Latin Mass, don't worry about your insurance and your comfortable priories, get over here and keep the faith. And Timmy comes running in and says, Father, Pope Paul VI died. And Father Hannafin, just automatic reaction, thank God! <laughs> and then he said, oh, well, we better pray for him. <laughs> so they said a prayer for his soul. But, uh, so that's, Father, the two fibers grew up around these old warrior priests. And they, they were hilarious, they were crabby, they were fighters, they were just Priests who kept the faith. Well, what a great blessing for them, you know. So anyway, uh, these are great days to be alive and to keep the faith. So keep going and and uh, help our youngsters also. And the poor youngsters, I can hear their stomachs growling. <laughs> so any other last question before we go? Pray for the Dominican nuns. I think they are foolish, foolish.
foolishly going along with this whole new direction. These girls know better, but they make terrible parish priests, but they make good teachers of girls. But I think and uh, I hope they'll wake up. Certainly if they follow along with Bishop Fillet in this compromise of the faith, uh, and they love Father Fluger and, and that whole scene, I'm sure there'll be at least some handful of them that will separate and stay in the line of Catholic tradition. So if you know any of these, of these nuns, try to get through to them and say, look, you can't go along with this, you know. Father, do they have any resistance nuns? Uh, there are. There is a, a group of Dominicans, not Fanjou, but Brignol, I think. They came with the resistance. The Carmelites in Germany, of course, and yeah, what uh, happened to the, the Carmelites in Germany? Didn't they leave? Uh, they, they might. I, th came I think they won Santa Fe contest yeah. with uh, that. That might have happened, yes. But I'm not clear. It's only by rumor, so maybe it's just a rumor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the sisters with Don Thomas Aquinas, some great nuns. And one of them is an American girl. And, uh, and, uh, and then the two sisters from Campo Grande. Uh, one is an African, she's Brazilian, but dark, and the other one is uh, a, a registered nurse. And they have converted a Buddhist doctor. Uh, when I was there, they had me drive around, do sick calls and anointings, and uh, they prepare the people for death. They, they, they're kind of nursing, teaching nuns, which is what we want to start in Kentucky. Nur nuns that nurse, to have nursing experience and hopefully down the road midwife experience so they can deliver babies without all the nonsense of the medical field and doctors telling you you can terminate this abortion. And then, um, and then teaching catechism as well. And there's one great thing about Americans, probably Canadians too, you know, priests, all right, hi father, bye father, but nuns, Americans just love nuns. They'll obey nuns. Just nuns have this tremendous effect. And I think it goes back to the Civil War because the nuns were out on the battlefield. Two soldiers in Galveston, Texas were lying on the field wounded. And one of them said, hey, what are those two ladies coming out here? And the other one said, he was Catholic, he said, those are the sisters. They're going to get shot. Tell them to get out of the way. He said, no, they, they don't fear the bullets. God protects them. And they were right, walking right in the battlefield taking care of the sick and dragging them off to the hospital, the nuns. And in Gettysburg, St. Elizabeth Seton, her nuns, went up to Gettysburg with horses and carts and many carts to help drag off the wounded and bury the dead and take care of the sick. And a lot of Confederate soldiers died, converted, because of the nuns. And there's a famous one with Father John Bannon. The nun was there many months taking care of the sick Protestant and uh, he finally said I want to be Catholic <clears throat> so she brought the priest Father John Bannon and uh, it was a big it's Irish guy who was a Confederate chaplain and when he was asked by a Union general soldier can you if I if you have to can you bury my some of my Union soldiers that are Catholic and Father John Bannon said uh, general I would Proudly and gladly bury all the Union soldiers. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this good priest, he went to uh, the sick bed of the dying man and he asked this man, Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth? And this soldier would say, Sister, do you believe that? Yes, I believe it. Okay, I believe it too. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, he, that he was true God and true man, and he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the cross, and was, died for our redemption? Uh, sister, do you believe that? Oh, yes, I do. All right, I believe it too. So they went through the whole profession of faith, everything through the sister. So he was finally baptized. Sister, is this okay? Yes, God wants this. It's, and he died a Catholic, thanks to the sister. So the sisters had a tremendous influence in the U.S., and Americans just love the nuns, they just do. And when you've got good nuns who are happy, joyful to serve Christ, who have the faith, that's just gold. That's just gold. And 
You know, nuns are powerful. They are Christ's brides, and, and we need contemplative nuns, absolutely. We need more contemplative nuns, but we also need active nuns, the Marthas. And that's what Father Pfeiffer and I hope to see, God willing, in Kentucky as well, somewhere down the road. Because where we are, there were so many nuns and seminaries and priests and monks, Trappists, in that area. And Father, I'll close with this, Father Urban Snyder, the old Trappist, take it or leave it. But he said, someday this land where we are in Kentucky, Our Lady Mount Carmel, will be a place of pilgrimage someday. So, well, leave it at that. Okay, I know it's getting late.